$18,285 has been prevented immediately knocking the price tag of this home down by almost $20,000. Imagine if somebody came to you and said, I can take $20,000 off the price tag of your home right now and won't require you to do anything different but pay your bills a better way. Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. This is VIP Financial Ed. My name is Matthew Pillmore. I'm helping you do it further, faster financially through video trainings like these where we walk you through a live case study helping you understand exactly how we took somebody from where they are and leapfrogged them to where they wanna be by just helping them design a roadmap where they're banking and borrowing a much better way. So make sure you stick around, this one's gonna be awesome. All right guys, thank you for tuning in today. We've got a great episode of How Did We Do It? This individual known as AG, which are his initials in order to protect anonymity, is a very exciting case study of somebody who just felt like they were treading water every single month, dumping a little bit of extra money into their savings account, but not really getting where they wanna end up, which in their case is investing in real estate. What I wanna demonstrate for you here today is just a hypothetical of what they are working toward. It is a coaching member, so it's somebody that is actively involved with our coaching team, getting coached regularly and fast tracking their objectives. But for you, the concepts are really what I want you to pay attention to. So don't look at this as anything other than educational. Results vary for absolutely everybody. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and dive right in. As you can see on the screen here, we've got three specific objectives that these debt weapons will help AG accomplish. The first is the growth of assets. In his case, he'd like to invest in real estate. The second goal that we wanna help fast track is the elimination of liabilities. And this is really where our specialty comes in. What we're best known for all over the world is being able to help people position themselves to use banking products in order to eliminate their liabilities, specifically debt related in a small fraction of the time. And what this results in is putting tens of thousands and even hundreds of thousands of dollars in most cases back into the pocket of the borrower so they can then use that money to reinvest elsewhere or design the lifestyle they wanna live. The third and final category, which really falls into the elimination of liabilities, is being able to stockpile emergency reserves. We do separate this as its own necessity because I, I've concluded after more than a dozen years and speaking with thousands of families during that time about their personal financial objectives that financial security really is a necessity. It's something that people need in order to feel a sense of safety, so we treat that very sensitively. The debt weapon process allows people to do this. So let's talk quickly about the three steps that we are perpetually focusing on in order to, what I like to say, dominate the banks. The first is optimizing both personal and business credit profiles. Now, when we talk about personal credit, we're always referring to FICO credit. It does require 700 and better personal credit score, FICO credit score, in order to start accessing the debt weapons in the second step of this process. So that is our first goal. What you'll find in AG's profile is that he has not yet met that minimum requirement. So that will always be a first step. Doesn't matter whether you're starting with an 800 credit score or a 670 credit score, we're prioritizing credit on an ongoing basis. If you already have an 800, that's great. It's just a hurdle you don't have to overcome. It just means that our action plan will include steps to protect and maintain that high credit versus steps like an AG's case where we're really working towards enhancing credit initially. The next goal when it comes to credit is being able to drive that up to a 760 and better. So the long-term goal is a 760 and above when it comes to credit scores. Keep in mind credit scores are just one small component of your credit. And what you'll hear us talking about over and over again in our trainings is that it really boils down to your general lender worthiness, your borrowing strength. Creditors are gonna look well past your credit scores these days. In underwriting, they're looking at the details inside the report, not just what your scores look like. So we wanna make sure we protect and maintain this profile above a 760 once we get it, and also look as strong as possible in every application we submit. Which leads me to the second step. So the second step of this process is leveraging the strong credit to access these capital accounts. And there are 16 categories of these accounts that we've identified. And it's easy to kind of compartmentalize them like that, much easier than just relying on individualization of each of these accounts because there are thousands of types of debt weapons. This is probably the single most common question I get is, what type of debt weapon should I access? That's like coming to me and saying, what kind of car should I drive? Well, that depends. 
We've got to talk about the purpose. So let's talk a little further so that you can continue to expand, expand your clarity on this section of the plan. First of all, the thing you need to make sure you understand is there's no such thing as having too much credit. No such thing as having access to too much money. So we're always adding more. The goal is at least $25,000 per year, every year. That number can be as high as $250,000. Now, if we don't hit that minimum, it's okay. This does not affect our ability to achieve long-term objectives, but the positioning of being able to get access to these is really important on an ongoing basis. And what we're doing is we're building out a diverse inventory or collection of these capital accounts, all of which serve a different purpose. We've talked previously about the comparison between motor vehicles and debt weapons. And I really like that metaphor because it kind of helps us reference it in our minds and compare it to something that we actually are very familiar with. If I were to categorize motor vehicles, I could do that very easily as well. I'd probably come up with somewhere around 16 or maybe even more. If I categorize them, say, starting with airplanes and then automobiles and then maybe helicopters and then motorcycles and jet skis and snowmobiles and motorboats and scooters. All of these serve a different purpose. And all of them would be the right answer, depending on the purpose, if the question was asked, which one is best? So if I had a collection of motor vehicles that included all of those, I would be in a much better position under any given circumstance to accelerate my movement from position A to my destination, desired destination of position B. That's true with the financial equivalent that we call debt weapons. These are simply vehicles most of the time provided in banking or lending institutions that allow us to kind of supercharge or fast track where we want to end up. So if you think about it that way, it's a little bit easier to understand. In some cases, it's best for me to use an airplane, and in other cases, it's best to me, for me to use an automobile. But just because I have a Ferrari doesn't mean that that will serve my purpose well if I need to, say, haul a ton of bricks or drive off-road up in the Rocky Mountains. Obviously not gonna be a great vehicle for that. Something that's designed for off-road usage or for hauling loads, now we're talking about a completely different type of vehicle. So we need to use the right vehicle for the right purpose instead of the wrong vehicle for the right purpose. Usually this quantity of 25,000 will boil down to between two to eight new accounts per year. This is a very specific and controlled number. It's important to understand that we're deliberately minimizing the frequency with which we're going out and getting access to new accounts. It's important to understand that most of these are unsecured. And what that means is it's not collateralized by some asset. Now we do rely on collateralized or secured debt weapons from time to time, like home equity lines of credit, but those tools could be very dangerous, especially in a volatile economy, which we have now. So it's really important for us to start to focus on which ones are going to be best in any economic climate. And that involves the unsecured types of debt weapons. Many times these accounts will sit unused. So I have several hundred thousand dollars worth of accounts right now that never get touched. Now we'll use them from time to time just to keep them open and active because banks have a tendency to take accounts away when they're unused, meaning they'll freeze them or close them in order to offer it to another borrower that's perhaps a little more active. So what we do is we'll use them for very small purchases that we've already budgeted for already, and then we'll pay those accounts off using strategies that we talk about in some of our other trainings. There are four specific questions that our coaches help each coaching member answer along the way in order to help them get access to the right types of debt weapons through this technique and through this, this system. The first is what will it be used for? Again, if we know what the process and the purpose is, we can start to narrow down which account is best and who is currently providing it. Those two questions need to be answered accurately in order to submit an application. But before we can go out there and start to write our names on an application along with a social security number, which is going to result in a hard inquiry and a negative impact to our credit, we've got to make sure that we answer this question, when do I apply correctly? The timing is very important because of the relationship between the application and your credit. If you do this process inaccurately, you will be left with credit that's in shambles. You will not be lendable. We have to make sure this is done correctly. The third and final step in this three-step process is all about cash flow. If we utilize these new capital accounts slash debt weapons 
it will help us accelerate these three goals that we talked about, growth of assets, elimination of liabilities, and the stockpiling of emergency reserves, which happens to be both sides of the balance sheet, asset growth, liability minimization, resulting in a cash flow increase. When you focus on both of them simultaneously, mathematically, there is no faster way to turn debt into wealth. Let me show you what I mean. We're gonna visit AG's current cash flow cruncher. This is the spreadsheet that we provide for you as a complimentary gift. You can see that the cash flow summary page imports the data from all of these other tabs and then provides us this nice clean overview of what we're looking at. This page is non-editable. You can see here, I can click on these fields, nothing happens. The most important number that I'm looking for on this page is the net cash flow down here at the bottom. You can see $1,776 per month is the average that's left over, also known as disposable income. Now we define cash flow as the difference between all streams of income minus all expenses each month, including debt servicing. What is left over is the total that technically could sit in a savings account. When I spoke with AG, he had indicated that this number did not feel accurate. So as we go through these tabs, we're looking for ways of creating a higher level of accuracy. It's important to know that creating a 100% accurate cash flow cruncher is impossible. You can't do it. So what we do instead is err on the side of conservatively accurate averages. In order to do that, we're gonna create a miscellaneous kind of catch-all category here on the personal expenses page, which itemizes his cost of living in both household, automobile, and living expenses, which includes all discretionary items, travel, gifts, and you can see that gifts doesn't have any acknowledgement. We don't have anything in here for travel, which means weekends away, something like eating out would have to be encompassed here in the food category. I'm not convinced, neither was he, that this number reflects everything that he's spending every month. So we're gonna add a $500 category here on the personal expenses page to just be over the top conservative, when I ran this past him, he was completely open to that. If we can get through a roadmap where we're hypothesizing the potential of bringing these debt weapons into his life and we impress him with a worst case scenario, obviously the math will then determine whether or not working together makes sense based on his level of satisfaction with the outcome compared to what he's been able to achieve so far. So let's go through these three steps and just kind of illustrate what this might look like. First of all, you can see we have a 670 FICO credit score that we talked about. This was actually pulled by a mortgage lender and it was as recent as just a few days ago. So we know that this is going to require the enhancement work first. I'm gonna give that an estimated six months just to be very generous with that timeline in order to predict, hey, there, it might take a little longer than we had hoped. But nonetheless, in the meantime, that means that he's got a new cash flow position of 1,276 after adding this $500 category here that will be contributing towards his progress over that first six month period. So we're gonna start working through some very simple techniques to enhance his general credit worthiness, his credit profile, we're also gonna start building his business credit profile because he is a business owner. And over the first six months, we're going to take that new cash flow of $1,276 and we're going to multiply it in order to determine how many cash reserves would be left by the end of that six months if we were just stashing it away in savings. Speaking of savings, it appears that AG has been stockpiling some money in the bank, uh, totaling now $11,400. So after six months, if this number were added to this, we'd be at somewhere around the $19,000 mark. Instead of allowing this to grow, $11,400, we're just going to start applying this $7,600 toward outstanding balances to start driving debts away while we're using other techniques to increase credit scores at the same time. The impact will allow credit to move twice as quickly as it otherwise would but it really does result in this balance of 19,431 being reduced by at least this 7656, which would all be principal. If we assume that 100% of these minimum payments are going toward interest costs because the interest rates are so high, obviously that wouldn't be the case. 
he would be applying some principle to these, but we're gonna be, again, very, very conservative. I'm gonna take 76.56 and assume that the majority of this is going toward principle. So what I'm gonna do is just knock this down by about 74.31 to keep the math really simple, leaving about $12,000 in outstanding credit card balances. Now I'm gonna bundle all that together on just one account, just for purposes of being able to see what our grand totals look like. And what we're gonna do is start to look at when the debt weapon comes six months from now in 2017, we're looking at at least $25,000 this year. In 2018, I always have a general milestone of setting a target of doubling that number each and every year following until we get to at least six figures where I'd like to see the number stay. I wanna see at least six figures every year following this where over the next handful of years, every single household is getting access to hundreds of thousands of dollars more than they otherwise would have by just simply saving this on their own. So presumably we have at least $25,000 to work with in around six months from now, credit is obviously getting better already because we've satisfied over $7,000 worth of principal on the outstanding that we've begun with. And at this point, we're just gonna satisfy the rest of this in full using the new debt weapon. So this is going to be paid off, which has an immediate impact to the credit, significantly improving it. It also drives the cash flow position much higher because these minimum payment obligations have all been eliminated. So you can see that now the cash flow has improved to $1,841 from that 1,200 and change. Where it, uh, what was that? About 500 some plus above. So we're looking at about $565 more on a $1,250 starting cash flow position. Guys, this is, is huge. I mean, we're at nearing 50% improvement to cash flow without AG having to earn any more money. This is based on the same income level and the same spending habits. We have not increased the budget, meaning that we're not restricting or sacrificing from the lifestyle that he had when we first started talking, and yet cash flow is improving substantially. So now that money is gone uh, as far as those minimum payments, meaning that the net cash flow is improved to 1841. Now, this is where the paycheck parking process begins. We've transferred 12,000 from the credit cards to here on this improved debt weapon, allowing us the ability to bring all income against this debt weapon, pay all expenses out from this debt weapon, and the cash flow stays parked. It's essentially replacing what everyone would argue is an inadequate checking or savings account. Checking and savings accounts do very, very little for us they do nothing for us from a monetary standpoint, but really all they're doing is providing us liquidity, safety, and convenience. It gives us the opportunity to pay our bills very easily. It's a safe place, we think, to store our money. And it gives us the opportunity then to use an account that actually generates some reward due to the use. Every time we pay check park against this account, every time we rent check park against an account like this, we're bringing down the average daily balance of that account, paying significantly less interest over the time period that we have a balance, and then the balance is paid off in full by strategic cash flow placement, meaning that very little interest is paid because it's such a short period of time where this balance exists. The math is super easy to calculate because every time if we were to pay check park or rent check park money against a balance, pay all of the expenses and debt servicing each month until it's paid back out of that account and the cash flow is left parked against the account, I can simply take that $12,000 starting balance and divide it by the cash flow position of $1,841. I'm just gonna round it down. Again, everything is gonna be very conservative here. And you can see that this will tell us approximately how many months this will take to pay back if it were a 0% account. It's not a 0% account. Most of these accounts range from 5% up to as high as 18%. And what you'll find is that the interest rate makes very little difference because the short timeline restricts the total amount of interest costs to a very small sum. High interest rates paid off in a very short period of time means very little interest costs. Low interest rates, paid off in a very long period of time means very high interest costs. What I'm trying to help people understand is that it's not the interest rate that you care about. It's how much total interest you're gonna have to pay. Dollars and cents, that's what matters. You can see here that this is a 6.5 month timeline. Let's go ahead and round it to seven months to account for the small amount of interest that's going to be paid over this six to seven month period. So now seven months later, 
We've already been six months down the road to go credit. Seven months after that, we've now satisfied this balance in full and 100% of the non-mortgage related credit card balances have been paid. We're 13 months down the road. Now over that period of time, we've been making $332 payments on these two accounts, Lendmark and the student loan. So if we take this $332 payment and we multiply that over the course of 13 months, we know that that period of time has required $4,300 worth of, uh, of payments being made toward these accounts. And we can see the interest rates on these are relatively low. So the vast majority of this $4,300 will be going toward principal. I'm gonna use a $3,000 sum as a conservative number where we'll reduce the total principal amount by that sum of $3,000. So I'm gonna just knock this student loan down from 7341 to 4341, leaving $6,186 or less that still has to be paid before we attack the mortgage. So I'm gonna go ahead and pay this off using the exact same debt weapon, 6186. And as you can see, it didn't require us to get access to more money. Why might we be getting this? Well, we're gonna start using this to put money as down payments on new assets like real estate. This is what AG's objectives include as he wants to start buying a portfolio of long-term rental properties, but he doesn't wanna to have to save his money to do it. As you can see so far, we haven't even touched the $11,400 in cash reserves that was there when we first met. That's simply being left alone. I'm gonna leave it in that account, even though it would be better for him to pay this off. Let me give you an example. If all he did was take from this $11,400 enough to satisfy this $6,186, it would leave him 5,000 more to work with in the account just sitting there unemployed. But he would instantly free up $332 per month in payments. If he's not earning $332 every single month from his bank to have $6,186 parked in there, then this might be worth consideration. We can always replace those reserves using the debt weapon. If he ever wanted or needed to go back into debt, he can just pull it right out of this debt weapon and put it back into the account. Instead, I'm going to leave it alone. We're just going to, we're not going to touch it for this hypothetical because I want to calculate the timeline as if he didn't have it. So if we now have these two accounts paid off, we're increasing the cash flow position by another $332 every single month. $332 increase is almost another 20% of this improved cash flow position above where they are now without any increase to income and without any restrictions on spending beyond what they were spending when we first met. So we've got another 332, bumping that cash flow position to 2174. Guys, we're not far off from doubling the cash flow in one month over a year out. So this is 13 months down the road and their cash flow position is coming close to being doubled. We're now going to have to pay this 6186 back. By using the paycheck parking process, we know that 6186 divided by the new cash flow of at least $2,100, 21, almost 75, is a little under three months. And we know that the interest costs on this is gonna be very close to nothing because we're gonna be paying it back in such a short period of time. So we know in three months, this is gone. So literally 14 months down the road and we're 100% non-mortgage related debt free. Guys, AG hasn't been non-mortgage related debt free in over 15 years. He was ecstatic about this potential. And there's even better news. We now get to attack the existing and future mortgage balances using similar techniques. In his case, we've got the $165,000, 3.75% 30-year amortized adjustable rate mortgage coming out at $110,000 if this 3.75% interest rate held true through the entire life of the loan. We know adjustable rate mortgages aren't going to do that. In fact, interest rates were just raised again and the chances of them going down before they up is slim to none. So they're most likely gonna keep ratcheting up year after year. With that in mind, we really have to focus on this as a priority. In his case, if he were to allow this to be paid off organically, it would take until 2043 to be eliminated. 2043 doesn't even sound like a real year. What we're gonna do instead is flip this amortization schedule upside down and start attacking it immediately. Before we do that, let's take a look at what I think represents everything wrong with the lending industry. This amortization schedule is built to confuse us. Many people that I study call this the most insidious device ever created. 
You can see here why. The interest to principal ratio is over two to one. Furthermore, the principal contribution every month is only increasing by about 75 cents, 78 cents. 78 cents increase to principal just wasn't cutting it for AG. And there are many ways that we can attack and eliminate this mortgage in a fraction of the time. One way would be to just simply take this extra $2,000 every month in principal in cash flow and apply it towards the principal reduction. That will result in a similar timeline and total interest cost. However, it's a horrible option for somebody that wants to invest. Keep in mind, if you don't plan to invest, you're not planning on retiring. Retirement requires a replacement of transactional income that you're trading your time to earn with more residual and passive income that is getting you paid even when you're asleep. So they're going to have to invest. And knowing that they want to, taking this extra cash flow every month and simply allowing it to sit against what we call dead equity will not leave him any money left over to invest with, which is why debt weapons are so incredibly important to include in this strategy. So what we're going to do is continue to replace the reserves of that $2,000 every month in cash flow with new debt weapons being acquired throughout each and every year. As long as we're getting $25,000 a year, we know it covers this current cash flow position. In their case, if we've been doing this now for about 14 months, we should have around $75,000 available. We're going to use a small amount of that over and over again in, in cycles in order to flip this initial amortization upside down while they are out hunting for their next investment. And that property can be added at any time. I'm going to go through the rest of this example as if they are not purchasing real estate, knowing that they probably will. The reason I'm going to do that is if they add real estate to this equation, it's only going to speed the process up for the better. So by going through the rest of the example as if they're not buying it, it's a worst case scenario. We also know that it's exactly what they're facing today. If they chose not to buy a property in three months, I have no way to control that. So why would I include that in an example where you know I don't have a crystal ball in order to know exactly whether three months from now or three years from now that first property will be added to the equation. So let's stick with what we know to be fact. We know we have a nation star mortgage of $160,253 outstanding balance. Started at $165,000, interest rates just bumped up slightly on their last movement last November, and it will be doing that again next November, presumably, since rates just moved again. So we've got a 3.75% rate. I'm going to leave it as if it's going to stay that way all the way through the lifetime of the loan, even though we know that's overly optimistic in their case, which will kind of provide us with a worst case scenario in terms of the result on the example. And I like it that way. We're going to scroll ahead to today's date. You can see here, March of 2017. You can see here that their interest to principal ratio doesn't look a whole lot better. So we're going to start applying lump sum amounts. And now I'm going to take a, in this case, a six month rule. Okay. So I've got $2,174 multiplied times six months. This is what we call the MLS, the maximum lump sum. We talk about this in all of our trainings, check them all out. This totals a $13,044 sum. Now, what that means is every six months through paycheck and rent check parking, we know that this initial lump sum balance that we borrowed from a debt weapon to apply towards the mortgage will be paid back. So every six months, we can apply another $13,044. With that in mind, on this very first month, we're going to skip ahead 14 months because that's the timeline it took to pay back the non-mortgage balances. So this is payment 47. We're going to jump ahead to payment 61. This is May 1st of 2018. We're going to apply our first 30, 13,000, was it 88? 44. 13,044 lump sum amount. And take a look at what happens here. $18,285 has been prevented immediately knocking the price tag of this home down by almost $20,000. Imagine if somebody came to you and said, I can take $20,000 off the price tag of your home right now and won't require you to do anything different but pay your bills a better way. I'm sure that would excite you. Let's go ahead and do this every six months. We know that uh, they can do this again on payment 67. They can do this again on payment 73. They can do this again on payment 79. And we're gonna follow this all the way to completion here. Along the way, the goal would be that they would be purchasing a piece of real estate, speeding this up because of the increased cash flow position. However, let's see what it does without it. Just a couple more here. 
and it looks like the last one here is only going to be $1,608. That's the last payment. I've got good news and I've got great news. The good news is their house just became $68,000 less expensive. The great news is that the payoff is November 1st of 2022, which is five and a half years from now when there'll be 100% mortgage and non-mortgage debt free. Not owing one penny to anybody in the world. Think about it. When was the last time you didn't owe a single penny to anybody? Regardless of the economic climate, they'll be safe. Regardless of job circumstances that he cannot control, they'll be safe. Regardless of business success or failure, they won't have to worry about the negative impact of having debt-related liabilities every month, which means that their new cash flow position has increased with this $764 contribution of principal and interest factored in to almost $3,000 every single month. Look at their revenue and assets. He could lose his job with the Arizona Department of Ag and he still would be safe. He could lose his business related income and he would still be safe. The point I'm trying to make is don't underestimate the power of living a debt free life. We can help you accomplish the same type of result. Five and a half years, maybe yours is eight, maybe yours is 10, but what is it today? How many years would it save you if I could knock two thirds of the timeline off of your existing schedule? How much would it save you if I could knock three quarters of the timeline off of your existing schedule? This is what we do every single day. We're known for being the absolute best in the entire world at accomplishing credit profile optimization, capital account acquisition, and cash flow maximization. So if any of those things sound exciting to you, Make sure you go to freecoachingcalendar.com and make sure you share this information with your community so that we can improve the social economics of this country one household at a time. Thank you so much for tuning in. Make sure you check out all of our videos. We've got lots more to come each and every week. So subscribe, like, and share. We'll see you on the next one. All right, so I realize that some of you have not gotten one of the single most popular budgeting tools available, not to mention it's free, and that is called the Cash Flow Cruncher. So what I want to do today is walk you through the process of downloading your very own copy. It comes in the form of an Excel spreadsheet, so it's very easy to use and uh, it's quick to navigate. So let's go ahead and walk through that process together. Go to cashflowcruncher.com, which will take you to the download page. Simply type your email address into the field to claim your free copy and go ahead and select the red button. Immediately it'll pull up the download button, which will open a new cash flow cruncher spreadsheet. The first page it'll open is the cash flow summary tab, which is a non editable page. It's very important to understand that this opening tab will not require you to put any information into these fields. This actually imports the data from the other tabs below. Now, if you've ever used an Excel spreadsheet, you'll navigate the spreadsheet by going to individual pages down here. And it'll start